Oh, I, I better. Uh oh. Hey guys, how are you? How are you? Good. How are you? How is your new new place? Oh, it's fine. If yeah. we can put more boxes. Yeah, well, those can wait. Okay, I'm seeing nothing right now. I'm seeing my email. Do I just click on that again? You're not seeing my picture or no. anyone else's picture? Uh, let's see. I see you, Christina. Well, that's uh, great. Vanessa. Hi, Vanessa. Oh, I see you now. Hi, Vanessa. Hi, Christina. Hi, <laughs> Um, I wanted to introduce to you guys, uh, Dr. Patrick Stratman, who um, took some time out of his busy schedule, which we very much appreciate. He's an orthopedic surgeon from DuPage Medical Group, and he's going to give a presentation. So he'll share his screen um, with the presentation and we'll um, talk about surgical and non-surgical solutions to hip and knee issues. And then um, I'm gonna have everyone muted while he presents. And then once he's finished, we can unmute everybody and if we'll have about 20 minutes or so for some Q and A and we'll get out of here about eight o'clock. Okay. All right. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and mute everybody one second and then I will turn it over. And I'm gonna to have to unmute you, Dr. Stratman. There you go. I'm gonna mute myself and uh, Dr. Schlottman, it's all yours. Great, thanks for the introduction, Christina. Uh, once again, I am Patrick Schlottman. I am one of the orthopedic surgeons at DuPage Medical Group. Uh, certainly a big uh, thanks to all of you as well for taking time out of your day uh, to, to join this seminar. I think it's gonna be uh, really educational and, and very helpful. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Hopefully everyone can see it at this point. <clears throat> so I am a fellowship trained, specialty trained uh, adult reconstruction surgeon uh, focusing on both first time hip and knee replacement and second and third time if it comes to that. Uh, <clears throat> just a little bit about why I'm talking to you today and uh, what my background is. Uh, I did college out at Brown, came back uh, home to Chicago to do my medical training at Loyola and then uh, spent a year focusing on just hip and knee replacement. I go to several hospitals, just kind of the way things work nowadays. Um, so I operate out of Elmhurst and Edward, as well as one of the advocate hospitals. This is purely an educational talk, certainly just meant for discussion. Um, but again, a big thanks to the Naperville Park District for uh, helping put this on and helping me meet all of you and uh, definitely Don Joy for helping uh, organize. So as uh, Christina said, uh, we're gonna kind of go through this outline here. We're gonna talk about hip and knee pain, talk about how to, how to treat it, kind of the more detailed discussion about what joint replacement surgery is and how the post-operative course goes. So as I'm sure all of you know, you know, this is kind of probably the most debilitating musculoskeletal disease that we have uh, in our country and the world. Um, certainly is very impactful on how people do uh, both hobbies as well as just simple things uh, around the house. There are three primary causes um, which you may have been told, which relates to your pathology in your knee or your hip. Uh, osteoarthritis, which is definitely the most common kind, uh, we can see, you know, wear at a specific area and you become that proverbial bone on bone or very close to that, at least, to, uh, you know, re regular pain and stiffness, rheumatoid arthritis, more part of a global pathology inside your body, uh, where likely multiple joints are affected and <clears throat> your, your knee or your hip wears out in a symmetric fashion. And then of course there may be a surgery that you had younger in uh, you know younger in your life or uh, some accident that you were in that uh, started the process of arthritis in a post-traumatic fashion. So those are the kind of three general diagnoses that you know we would talk about in the office in terms of why your joint space is wearing out. 
There, of course, is the non-surgical treatment options, which are appropriate for the large majority of people and always should be the starting place uh, that, that any surgeon should recommend for you. These all have been studied uh, and they are the specific recommendations laid out by the American Academy of hip and knee surgeons as well as orthopedic surgeons. So while there's many options that may be counseled to you, these are the ones that are truly recommended. Of course, we can take pressure off of your affected joint slash limb with a walking aid. Heat or ice can help provide some temporary relief during the day. Physical therapy, outpatient or home physical therapy program is certainly recommended. Uh, to take pressure off of your diseased joint, uh, create um, stronger muscles to lessen the joint reactive force. So physical therapy is certainly an important step to, to do before <coughs> considering anything else. And then anti-inflammatories, as you can imagine, arthritis, itis being inflammation, uh, certainly an anti-inflammatory prescribed or over-the-counter is... Uh, is a, always a good thing to try. Uh, additionally, rather than taking it orally, uh, corticosteroid injections are <clears throat> extremely helpful for a majority of people in terms of dampening the pain inside their joint. Uh, there's a lot of stuff out there regarding gel or Hyligan injections, not a recommended treatment in our guidelines. There's little downside to trying it. Um, but expectations should definitely be tempered. So there's about nine major studies that don't show too much a difference between gel and placebo, but again, there's certainly a role for it um, if necessary. So <laughs> we go through all of the non-operative treatment, we see how the response is, and then these are certainly the questions that I ask myself and you in the office, and these are uh, questions to think about for, you know, if you're ever considering um, a more definitive treatment plan for your hip and knee pain. I think night pain is a big deal. Able to do stairs is a big deal. Walk more than two to three blocks or a parking lot. If you're unable to do that or your knee or hip starts to aggravate you at that point in time, the benefits certainly outweighs, outweighs the risk for uh, surgical intervention. And then of course, doing the things that you wanna do, travel. You have to walk in the airport, you know, walk at your destination, kids, grandkids, uh, chase them around, pick them up. Uh, all those things can, can greatly be hampered uh, by a uh, arthritic joint. So we'll talk a little bit about what a total hip replacement involves, a little more of the nuts and bolts of the procedure. So you can kind of see on your screen on the left side on this uh, animated picture, there's a, there's a joint. You can see the outline of the pelvis. You can see the tailbone in the middle. And then on that left side, that's the top of your thigh bone and that white area inside the socket uh, is your hip joint. So that's, <laughs> you know, in this, in this cartoon picture, relatively healthy. And then you can see this, this is a pretty accurate representation, even though it is a cartoon, what happens as your, as your joint wears out, it gets red, it gets inflamed and it gets deformed. Um, so when you look at an X-ray in the office, this is kind of a good representation of what you're looking at for the X-ray that's shooting straight ahead. Um, Again, you can kind of very see very clearly what is what happens with the with the hip anatomy as uh, your degenerative joint disease first. And then this is the X-ray that we're referring to. Um, so once again, left side, normal hip, healthy hip. You can refer back to the image that we just looked at, top of the thigh bone, right here in the center outline of the pelvis with the socket in it. As you can see, plenty of joint space in between, you know, over four millimeters. And then this is certainly end stage, but you get the idea of what a arthritic hip looks like, bone on bone, no space left. Uh, you may have these dark spots, which are you know, reactive cysts forming. And obviously it makes it very difficult for a range of motion, obvious mechanical block and very difficult to to do a lot of things that you would like to be doing. 
There is a video. And you can kind of see So again, that's the top of the thigh bone. We do take out the arthritic part. We do take out the arthritic socket and we put in these brand new parts to mimic your native bone and native cartilage to provide you with a nice smooth surface as you can see in this, in this depiction. So just the Cliff Notes version of that quick 15 second clip. Um, you can see the stark difference in the picture that we looked at before in terms of the worn away socket and the worn away ball that was articulating with it. And now what our hip implant looks like to mimic, uh, you know, the anatomy that you were born with. So this is just an example of a replaced hip x-ray. Again, kind of showing how we recreate your anatomy and recreate that space so you don't have that rubbing bone on bone feeling. <clears throat> this is a better picture of what we actually put in. So once again, your socket is kind of diseased and worn out. So we give this nice uh, shiny plastic cup. We put this plastic piece inside so it's not too metal or uh, hard bearing surfaces on each other. This polyethylene liner or this plastic is the thing that mimics your cartilage and gives you a nice smooth surface. Uh, and then you can see kind of the stem that we would put in and then the ball to mimic the ball that we cut out. Um, so it's not, it's, uh, not overly uh, complicated in terms of the modular pieces. There's not much going in, uh, but it, it, it does more than more than what we need, certainly. You'll hear a lot uh, in terms of how the surgery is done. And uh, I think it's important to talk about that briefly. So I would say at this point, there are two approaches that are most popularized. There's the posterior lateral approach, <coughs> um, which I do. Um, you're kind of laying in this position, you avoid cutting any of the muscles that allow you to move your hip outward or walk. Um, and uh, it's a very, very smooth recovery. There's also the direct anterior approach where you're on a table laying with uh, your head facing upward. Uh, this is, is equally slick in that we are again spreading muscle. We are not cutting muscle. We get right down the, the hip joint without disturbing any of your native tissue uh, and are able to insert all those parts that we just looked at that way. Both approaches have been studied and compared against each other. Hundreds of thousands of patients have been uh, been put in these registries to look at it and they have no significant difference uh, in terms of outcome in the first two weeks, six months or five years. So both are extremely appropriate to use um, with someone who, who is facile in, in both of them. I, I seem to have excellent results with, with either one, uh, even though you know, I'd say the majority of my people come in Having heard more about the anterior approach, uh, you know, I would say my posterior folks are, are equally happy as well. And are spice by two weeks. We'll go into uh, the knee replacement uh, in a similar fashion, just to give you guys a glimpse of what we do. So similar depiction of the anatomy, like the cartoon of the hip that we saw a few slides before. Uh, the, the idea still holds well, well even though this is a, a cartoon depiction, um, you do get this red angry cartilage slash tissue around your knee joint that makes it significantly worn out and will give you that painful rubbing feeling, catching feeling, uh, or grinding. This is a good depiction just like how we went through the hip now, the x-ray of what a healthy knee and an arthritic knee looks like. 
you can see once again in the healthy knee, bottom of the thigh bone, your femur, top of the shin bone, your tibia. You have this nice healthy dark space in between. That's your cartilage and all the cushion in between your, your femur and your tibia, your thigh bone and your shin bone. And you can see when we go to the picture of the arthritic knee, you do not have that space anymore. And that is that proverbial bone on bone that, that gets often characterized. Once again, short video of how it works. So this is a picture again, that's kind of your shin bone going back and forth. We make these cuts from a block that's fitted specifically for you. We take away about eight to nine millimeters. We're not cutting way up on your bone and your thigh. We're just shaving off about a nine millimeter piece on both the bottom of the thigh bone and top of the shin bone where you have that arthritis, where you have that diseased joint. And then we replace what we took with our metal pieces. Um, oops, sorry about that. So we put back what we cut and then similar to the hip, that's that plastic insert, which mimics your cartilage and gives you that nice smooth feeling that you were not having before when your joint was inflamed and uh, causing issues. There are two types of knee replacements that we can do. There's the partial knee replacement, which means that we're replacing one compartment or one area of your knee. The only way this surgery is successful is if you do not have any arthritis in your other areas. So it's important when someone tells you that you're a candidate for a partial knee to, to really make sure that the, the other parts of the knee which aren't being changed are actually pristine and healthy. Uh, there is a three times higher revision rate when you do do the partial knee replacement. It's a three times likelihood of needing to go back um, in the same incidence of, of, you know, continued pain. Because again, I don't know if uh, people do their due diligence in making sure that the partial knee is truly the right operation for the patient. On the other side, you can see very similar to the animated video, uh, the complete knee replacement. So you can see that the entire front surface of the knee has the metal and plastic. And that's, that's really what the terminology means when you hear about total knee replacement or complete knee replacement and partial. It's how much of the bone is being taken away. Is it the entire joint or is it just part of the joint? And again, it's really important to make sure uh, to identify where the arthritis is and choosing the operation that's gonna be best for you. And this is an example of what your x-rays would look like both on the left side for that partial knee, again, depicting what we just talked about in terms of, <clears throat> you know, your bone is still, still there on the one part of the knee. And then if we do the whole thing, then we resurface everything. And you have the shiny metal parts that go all the way across. And you can see the view from the front and view from the side of your knee replacement and how it completely mimics the outline of what your bone used to be uh, to give you that natural feeling after it's done. Uh, there, there are several different types of knee implants out there. Uh, I do think that this implant design depicted here is, is one that truly uh, your function that you had when you were 25 or 30. Uh, we know from other implants that depending on the radius of curvature of the metal piece we put in at the bottom of your thigh bone, uh, it can change on how well your quad function works. And so in order to get that muscle in front of your leg to wake back up as efficiently as possible, uh, this uh, Empower 3D implant uh, really helps enhance the recovery and get that muscle back to full strength. Additionally, you know, coverage in terms of making sure that the metal piece on your shin bone or on the top of your tibia is, uh, is also not impinging on anything and fully covering. It has a very good design in order to 
prevent any areas uh, that may cause uh, inflammation or pain afterwards. Um, and then the plastic insert that we talked about, there are again, different ones uh, that have been designed over time. And this one really helps keep the ligaments in your knee all the way from full extension to 120 degrees of flexion in appropriate uh, tension. You know, that's why, you know, <clears throat> you may hear people who feel like their knee is loose or unstable. Uh, this plastic piece that is depicted here uh, with that empowered design is really helpful in uh, preventing that from happening. So the question that everyone asks, how does the recovery go after having this surgery? Once again, after trying the physical therapy, the corticosteroid injections, the anti-inflammatories, we do the surgery. What is the expected timeline of recovery? So in general, come in, we do surgery, and then you're in the hospital likely as a, uh, for zero days as an outpatient or potentially just 23 hours. I would say at this point, the majority of my patients are able to go home, which is nice, particularly in this time with this uh, pandemic occurring. Um, we have uh, a very efficient team that, and a very efficient staff who's able to make that a safe process. And it's very nice not to get poked and prodded in the hospital overnight and, uh, and recover on your own. Of course, we make sure before you go home that you walk in the hallway, you do stairs, you make sure that you're safe to leave before we actually discharge you. But again, same day surgery is a very real possibility, uh, especially uh, in my hands. And then I would say, again, the, the hip and the knee differ a little bit, but you will be using a cane or a walker for a period of time. I think this is more in reference to the knee, maybe uh, anywhere between one to four weeks is probably better depiction for what my patients experience. For the hip, it's probably cut in half. But again, for the knee, maybe for the month, um, we use the cane. And then by the two month mark, I tell people you're about 75% better compared to before surgery. At the three month mark, you're 90% better. And then it's a year long recovery to get to 100%. It becomes very exponential though. And, uh, and how you feel afterwards, after those first uh, three to five days or so though. Uh, I think people notice right away that they can stand longer. They can walk longer than even before, even with the, the incisional pain. Um, again, I think we have found very good ways over the past five to 10 years to, to make it a much more efficient process than it was say 20 to 25 years ago when people spent three to five days in the hospital and um, or on, you know, only narcotics. You know, it's very important to have the proper pain regimen afterwards for your recovery and your safety. And why do we do outpatient joints? Again, it's not something that I just decided to do. Um, you know, it's, it's people who I've, I've, you know, trained with and, and worked with overall and there are a whole host of literature saying how safe it is and all these papers are from the last 12 months. So again, it's not uh, something that I take lightly in terms of doing for the right person. <clears throat> you know, as I'm sure you've heard, uh, the goal is, is to get you back to the things that we talked about before that you felt limited by, you know, walking outside for a prolonged period of time, getting in and out of a car, or being able to do low impact activity like biking or swimming or the treadmill or the elliptical. Getting back to golf, of course, is extremely important for a lot of people. It, uh, it truly is a, a process that will result in, in all these things listed and then some in terms of uh, how you feel once you get over that hump of uh, the initial discomfort. It does allow you to do all those things. And again, with the, with the implants that have been designed over the years, it makes it a much easier process to get there. Of course, you know, the surgeon recommendation is to not beat your implant up too much. 
it is a part just like any part in your house or your car um, it's it will wear out over time or become uncomfortable if you do certain activities luckily over the past 10 years we've developed a better plastic piece that goes in between uh, those metal pieces that we showed for both the hip and knee so when we came out with this better plastic piece you know we really can comfortably quote people 30 plus years of, of you know, lifespan rather than 10, which may have been commented on before. Um, again, if you're using the proper, the proper implant, it, it has much better longevity, but it is wise not to uh, uh, risk it with some of the activities that are listed here. So I think that wraps up uh, the presentation in terms of what joint disease is, what kind of the classifications are with the osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, and post-traumatic arthritis, uh, what options we have to avoid surgery, and then why we would consider doing surgery. Does it hurt when you do stairs? Does it hurt when you walk more than a parking lot to go grocery shopping or to a store? Uh, does it wake you up at night? You know, those are very real questions that uh, your quality of life can be you know, greatly impacted in a positive nature by going the surgical route. We showed some videos and hopefully made what the operating room experience actually was a lot more clear and uh, why we do certain things and how we do it. And then we went over to post-operative recovery, which once again has become much smoother than it was say 10 or 15 years ago. All right, thank you so much. I appreciate um, the very thorough uh, uh, presentation from Dr. Schrotman. If anyone has any questions, now would be the time. You can go ahead and unmute yourself and feel free to ask him. You know, we've got about 15, 20 minutes or so we can do some Q and A. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to unmute yourself and ask away. You? Yeah, I already Hi, this is Bob. Uh, hi, I, I have a question. I do in my future have uh, knee surgery uh, expected, uh, but I had two questions. One is, um, you know, one thing I've, I've looked at are um, downsides of doing knee replacement, like uh, infection and stuff. And then the second question is with these newer uh, um, components that are used. Uh, do you ever have to replace any of those? Uh, you know, with a 30 year life, is the, does the plastic go at some time? Uh, and is that replaceable without doing a whole knee thing again or don't have to worry about it anymore? Those are really good questions. Once again, thanks for making time tonight, Bob. I really appreciate it. Uh, to your first point, there, there are risks that are inherent with joint replacement surgery, knee replacement surgery, since you brought up knee. The quoted infection rate is between one and 2%. I think that I have a very good pre-operative protocol and screening process to help combat that, but you are right, it isn't a never event. I think, you know, luckily, knock on wood, I, I have not had to take care of any of my own yet, but, um, but that is, you know, a, a very real fear and a very real risk um, in terms of the, the patient and the physician, but we do take a lot of steps before even getting to the operating room to make sure that you are as healthy as can be so that you heal up and you don't get that, that infection that you alluded to. Uh, to your second point, the plastic that we put in now wears out at 0 0.01 millimeters a year. And the thickness of the plastic is um, you know, at least nine millimeters or eight millimeters. So you can imagine, you know, That's a lot. we say 30, the cuff it's not a, it's just like how they said 10 before but I mean 0.01 is, is pretty slow and um, you know I think it's just kind of dogmatic that we don't say it, it will uh, you know last a hundred years but you know that, that is kind of the reality with the way we've made it and how the manufacturers in the lab have, have designed it so and then if, if your plastic does wear out there is a procedure if that's the only thing that has happened over say x amount of years we can go in, we can leave the metal that's in there and we can simply exchange that bearing. It is a modular piece. We can just flip it out 
then we can put a new one in and then that's you know 30 minutes versus two hours for sure mm. does that answer your question yes thank you you're welcome you uh one follow-up you're saying two hours is uh is that the normal time for the complete knee replacement surgery yeah, I would, uh, I would say two hours is for if I have to go in there and redo something that's been done. If this is the first time knee replacement, the actual surgery time will probably be about 40 to 45 minutes. Wow. wow. Extremely efficient procedure. Wow. You're of course back there a little longer between getting your anesthetic, getting on and off the operating room table. But in terms of when your parts are in that we, that we, just looked at in the slideshow. It's about forty-five minutes, and then, uh, and then we get you get you all all closed up with a beautiful beautiful scar for everyone to see, and uh, and we get you get you getting onto rehab. Okay. Um. Uh, another follow-up then, if no one has any other questions. <laughs> I think these are all great. I think these are perfect. Uh, you you talked about uh, different kinds of hip approaches, but you didn't really say anything about knee approaches. Sure. Uh, they're different. Um, you know, I've heard like uh, minimally invasive, but I, it, not really, but <clears throat> are there different knee approaches uh, that affect the muscles differently in the healing time? Yeah, that's a really good question. There, there used to be different types of approaches. They are all in the same area. Um, we have found that, you know, we, we don't, go, you know, in the side of your knee or the back of the knee, there really is only one plane that we go through. And then I would say, you know, similar to what I alluded to with the anterior hip, you know, minimally invasive, I think it's just a billboard term. Uh, we haven't really found any difference between people who tried to coin a minimally invasive knee replacement versus the standard, you know, incision that is just really a couple centimeters longer. There's no difference in, uh, and recovery functionality. And in fact, the minimally invasive one had, set, had slightly higher uh, rates of failure and infection, probably just because, you know, you, you sacrifice being able to see everything and do a good job uh, with the hopes of saving, you know, a centimeter of scar just, just isn't worth it. Okay. So I, I certainly do make my decisions, you know, in, in an economical fashion. Don't have something going all the way up your thigh or all the way down your shin. <laughs> Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I have, I have a question. Go ahead, Mike. What is the uh, rehab protocol? Yeah, we, uh, so, you know, like we alluded to, same day surgery versus 23 hours for everyone. Depending on how you do with the physical therapist before you leave, um, you either have a home health physical therapist come and work with you a couple of times a week for the first 10 to 14 days. So you can have a, a period of home therapy where someone will come to your house for the first two weeks. And then with regards to the knee replacement, you're going to start the outpatient therapy at around week two, two and a half. And you, you, you do that anywhere from four to eight weeks, depending on your progress. Of course, that's just an average. But, um, but again, the, the rehab protocol can be done independently or through the guided help of a therapist. I think right now for, for knees, that, that is helpful for at least a short period of time. But, um, but I do have a rehab protocol for people who do it on their own. And of course, the physical therapist helps me with that in the hospital to to give you what you need. Does anyone else have any other questions for Dr. Stratman before we uh, finish up here? I have just- I'm not sure if you can hear me. Yeah, Larry. I'd like to, yeah, I'd like to know a little bit about the injection therapy aspects. There are many out there that are being advertised. Um, I know you didn't talk much about that at all. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you suggest before a replacement? 
Absolutely. Yeah, I, I probably see a, a magazine advertisement at least once a week from people who bring it in. So the only recommended injection from the Academy of Orthopedic Surgeon and the hip and knee replacement body is corticosteroid. That's the only one that we found through studying hundreds of thousands of patients that it will make a difference both in the short term, you know, month and long term three month period. The gel injection has very little data behind it. And I tell people who want to pursue it, it's probably a coin flip chance or worse of working. Um, but I, like I said, I don't discourage it because there's a little downside aside from getting your insurance to, to take care of it. Um, there's stem cell therapy out there. And there's other sorts of regenerative medicine. Uh, I've written a paper on that, and I think the conclusion that you should draw is that the enthusiasm outpaces the science. Um, I tell people that, you know, we, we have attempted this, trying to regrow cartilage is something that we've tried for the last 50 plus years, trying to regrow that space in between your bone on bone, and we just can't do it. Stem cells may work well for your tendons and your ligaments, but in terms of arthritis, I wouldn't be eager to go down that route with what's been published so far in terms of not being very efficacious or working very well. That uh, will put a large dent in your, in your wallet. Um, if, uh, again, probably little downside, but steroid injections actually recommended, gel injections sort of equivocal slash not recommended, stem cell therapy. Um, I don't think there's any good data out there for me to support that. I, I have comments. Um, I'm Vanessa and I had a knee replacement seven years ago on my right knee. And then I was getting, I knew I was going to probably have to have my left one done at some point because it was um, arthritic. Sure. Uh, I went with the stem cell route. Insurance does not cover it. It is several thousand dollars. Um, and the literature that I was, that the you know, doctor sh was showing me said years to life. I didn't even get one year out of it. I ended up having my second knee done this past January. Um, it was, I think because you're prepared more, you know what to expect. Um, I was able to go home that day, but I really had to make sure the anesthesiologist knew that he was gonna give me some kind of an epidural or a block. And, and I said, no, I really think I'm going home today unless something happens. So I did go home that day. Uh, maybe I was in the hospital totally from check-in at five. I left about 4.30 that day. Um, I was able to go back to some exercises at Fort Hill, probably after about three weeks, but I was still in physical therapy. So the therapists really were very good about, you know, telling me what I can and can't do and, and um, directing me in the right, the right spot. But I, uh, well, and I think I, I had, by the time I was done, COVID hadn't started yet. And I, I don't know if I could have still gone to therapy during the COVID, I'm not, I'm not sure. But um, one thing that I did have to find out is that when um, I, the therapist had said, well, we're ready to discharge you. I said, it's only been like four weeks, five weeks. I said, I, why? And then I said, is it because of insurance? And the, the doctor was willing to have it go longer if I wanted to do it. What was the only thing that I was not doing great with was walking downstairs. So I really had to work on that more on my own after I was discharged. But the doctor was willing to have me go for longer if necessary. So I, I've got two knees now and I could do most of the stuff that I had before. No jumping, um, no running, but, but everything else is, is, is better and I don't have the pain. Yeah, I definitely uh, appreciate you, you tuning in, Vanessa. Um, yeah, I think just to reiterate that first point, I think that kind of echoes what my paper says uh, in terms of what the stem cell therapy uh, really results in. And it's not necessarily uh, a healthier knee or a more comfortable knee. It's more just a, a dent in your wallet. And you have to think about why the surgeon is, is advocating for that some secondary gain in there uh, for he or she with uh, with the facility fee. So I would, I would just be cautious and I would really want you to see someone who, who knows the literature and has published and uh, and kind of really understands how it how it really uh, impacts you. And um, yeah, I think it's a pretty pretty good summary of, of how a knee replacement course goes. Yep. <laughs> um, I have a question. Um, I, I listen. 
I, to another seminar a few years ago, and things seem to have really improved. Um, and, but in terms of the post-op, we, we had been told that for the first two weeks after surgery, you really needed assistance, that you, you shouldn't have the expectation that you can just do things. Sure. So is that still the case? Because when you say that you're only, you don't need to be in the hospital and you're up on your feet and right. <laughs> on the first 24 hours, I'm thinking, what? Has that really, has that really changed that much? Yeah, no, I, I think that's a really good question. And once again, thanks for tuning in. I think, I don't think that we're discouraging having help. I think that's a big part of doing well after a joint replacement. It prevents you from going to a rehab facility, which was probably popularized still at that time. And we know people don't do as well there. So having home support is good. I think what should be stressed is that we make sure that you're safe and can do things around the home, even if it's just on the first floor for the first couple of days, but you can, again, walk between 100 and 250 feet, which will get you most places. You can do stairs, you'll feel comfortable doing that. But I, I, I do think that in order to control the swelling, which is the biggest part of controlling your discomfort, obviously having the ability to, to lean on someone and, uh, and have them be your helper for the, for the first one to three days, it certainly isn't discouraged and, and helps your pain level. But, but getting around is important. We give you the ability to do that with the, with the anesthesia that I give the anesthesia from the spinal from the anesthesiologist and and I, and I think it does, I think it has changed a little bit even over that time frame again depending on, on who's doing it but yeah definitely having someone who who will help you is still a big part of doing well. But but it sounds like it's not two weeks anymore. It could just maybe be a, a few days. I, I, I think I think it's a bell curve. I think that's an I think I think an average is probably still around a week. I think some people are are faster, and obviously some people need a little more time. But I I do think that in terms of getting up to the bedroom on the second floor, getting around to the bathroom and the kitchen and all of that that comes much quicker than I think was previously uh, advertised or suggested. Um, you, you will have the strength and the confidence to, to get around. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. But, but Anne, just so you know, when I did it, I left the hospital, they had me walking, but I was holding out a walker. I wasn't just walking, you know, free. Uh, I had the walker. And in fact, uh, I think after a couple of weeks when I was going to therapy, I felt pretty good. I came in with a cane. And they kind of yelled at me for using the cane when they said you should still be coming in here with the walk. So, so well, there's assistance that that you could. I mean, at home you could do stuff, but when you're walking outside, they really want to use it. It still sounds much improved because I was under the impression that those first two weeks of surgery were but really it's like the person could do nothing. <laughs> yeah, and, I, and I, again, I, I'm, I'm not gonna say that that doesn't happen. That would be completely untrue. But I mean, really, I think if you do all of the non-operative treatment, you kind of recognize why you're doing the knee replacement surgery. Someone isn't just putting it in. Uh, you, you are extremely motivated. And again, your, your new knee or your new hip will, will very much support Again, with a walker, with a cane, you know, that half of my people get out with canes, um, you know, what, what he or she wants to do. I think, I think you're right, though. I think it is different than between five and 10 years ago. I think we know how to give the injection during the knee replacement. The surgeon didn't used to do that. And the block that the anesthesiologist would give wouldn't cover the entire knee. So now that we know where to give the injection, that also helps with pain control. We know that, you know, the amount of Tylenol, an anti-inflammatory and opioid to give. So it isn't just opioid medicine. It makes a big difference. Thank you. Welcome. Does anyone else have any questions for Dr. Stratman before we wrap up here? I have one really quick. This is Michelle. Hey, um, I have been doing um, like the Kenalog injections for probably a decade. Sure. <laughs> um, you know, I can go maybe five or six months um, per one injection, which I know is pretty good. 
Um, but by the end of, you know, five months, yeah, I know I need to do it again. But uh, I guess my question is, how long can I keep doing that? Does it eventually start to destroy the, you know, the joint? That's, that's a good question and a good point. You are, you are certainly uh, more of the outside the box person in that they've been so effective for a decade. That's fantastic. I and mean, I think anyone would take getting five to six months out of their Kenalog injection. We only have studies in mice and rats that would say that it has an adverse effect on cartilage. We've tried to study it in humans and we've really found no clinical difference so if you're getting five to six months, I, I would not discourage from doing it. I think it will eventually fall off a cliff, um, not because of it's destroying the cartilage, just because of your body getting used to the medicine, even though it's been 10 years. Uh, but again, I, there have not been a lot of published downsides in terms of doing it for that long if you're getting that good of a result. Um, does that answer yeah, your question? Yeah, yeah that, that's great. My my ortho you know he's he's trying to get me to go a few more years before we have to do the <laughs> replacement sure. and you know i appreciate that I, I you know i'm 58 i'm not really quite ready to do that yet but yep. I, I was just curious as to you know how yeah. long i can possibly go with that yeah no i think i think again if, if if you were my patient i would i would not discourage you from continuing i'd probably advocate for it I think, like you said, you know, with your stated age, you know, your physiologic recovery, you certainly have, have some more time while you're still in the sweet spot um, of getting that surgery done. You know, I think when you get into your, you know, early to mid sixties, then it kind of becomes a game of, well, the steroid injections are working, but we just know the recovery is different as we reach certain age boundaries. But again, for you, I think, I think that's perfectly fine. Okay, great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. All right, guys, does anyone else have any other questions before uh, we uh, log out for the night? Thank you. Awesome. Well, I appreciate everyone joining. I appreciate Dr. Strotman for coming and, and taking time out of his very busy schedule to educate us and give us some some good things to think about. So um, I'll have his contact information with me. So if anyone ever wants to reach out to him, think of something different that you have a question about that you didn't think of tonight, or you want to set up, you know, an appointment with him, whatever, um, reach out to me. I can certainly give you his contact information if you haven't written it down from this presentation. Um, otherwise, uh, Dr. Schottman, thank you so much and uh, have everyone have a good rest of your Tuesday night. Thank, thank, you. You. thank, thank you. you. All right. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you.